Welcome back to ACLU Virtually on the Hill. Again, I'm joined by Marina Lowe, the ACLU's Legislative and Policy Council, to talk about what's been happening virtually and in person at the Utah Capitol for the past couple of days. Marina, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm happy to be off the hill with you, Jason. I can't speak to what's been happening at the Capitol, not having been there myself, but I'm happy to fill you in on, on what's been happening virtually. Right. Well, you're keeping very close tabs, I know, uh, including on what happened with bail reform. There are several different bills moving through the legislature. We talked about it last week. There's been some developments there with some of the major bills. Can you give us an update about bail reform and its prospects this year? Yeah, so this really does continue this debate. I think we touched on it a little bit last week. There are a lot of moving parts. HB 220 is a piece of legislation sponsored in the House by Representative Schultz, who's part of House leadership, um, that would repeal HB 206 from last year's um, session that was passed. Um, there was a lot of heated debate when the bill was being discussed on the floor with lots of perspectives. Um, you know, some people rightly pointing out that there have been real problems with the implementation around HB 206. Um, we are hearing that from public defenders and, and other criminal defense lawyers on the ground that they are seeing problems with the way that that bill um, actually played out in reality with people being held um, under no bail holds in larger numbers than we had seen before the implementation of 206. So that's a real problem. On the other hand, um, also hearing some pushback that repealing the whole statute you know, is maybe not the right way to go, that if there are problems with 206, we should start from that point and try and fix those problems rather than scratching the whole thing. So there was a heated debate. The bill passed nonetheless, moved on to the Senate. But at the same time, uh, we just saw yesterday, Senator Weiler dropped a bail bill, HB, uh, sorry, SB 171, um, which looks similar in some respects to the legislation Representative Pitcher was sponsoring, HB 240. Um, the bill looks um, somewhat, uh, I guess I would say, better from the ACLU's perspective, Weiler's bill does, than um, Representative Pitcher's bill. There are some provisions in there that, that were provisions that were in Stephanie Pitcher's bill that we don't see in Weiler's bill, which I think make it more favorable. But, um, you know, I guess I would just say that the conversation continues for sure. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of sort of standalone bills pop up that have bail provisions. HB 58, Representative Wilcox's riot bill, contains some language around bail that passed out of committee last week. Um, we also saw on an agenda for Monday of this week, although it was pulled and so maybe will be debated later on in this week, um, a really comprehensive piece of legislation targeting, bay, uh, targeting rioting in general by Senator Hinkins, SB 138. Um, we'll probably get into that bill at a later date. There are lots of problematic things uh, included in that bill, but one of those areas of concern has to do with bail as well. Um, so I think we're seeing bail as like a running theme this session, popping up in lots of different bills. And, and a couple of things uh, come out of what you just said. And one is that just because you pass a bill one session does not mean that it is in concrete. Those bills can be revised, repealed, as we're seeing with bail reform from HB 206 last year. The second is once a bill moves from one chamber to the other, there can be dramatic changes. Uh, and that, that happens, right? Like there's a bill that's favored by the House and House leadership. Once it moves over to the Senate, um, it can be changed. It can be adapted. Is that right? That happens? Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, there are a couple of different ways that can play out. It can it can die in the other body if there isn't support in the Senate, for example, for that legislation. Um, then it can also undergo a lot of changes. There can be amendments and substitutions made over in the second body in the Senate. When that happens, the bill has to go back to the House for the House to agree with those amendments before it can make its way to the governor's desk. So yeah, there are lots of um, lots of ways that this story can continue and change. And I think it's um, probably premature to try and predict what will happen with bail this session. Got it. A lot of pieces moving around. The situation's fluid. We'll check back in with you um, as soon as we can to find out what happens. Um, another bill, uh, also on kind of a criminal justice topic, is HB 245, the forcible entry bill from Representative Craig Hall. When I first read this bill, it had a lot of ingredients to it, a real toolkit based around this idea of uh, providing guardrails for law enforcement when they are pursuing a no-knock or um, a, an announced knock warrant at someone's house. Can you tell us a bit about the background to how this bill came to be, what has happened before, and, and whether or not you think all these provisions could make it through? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, in some ways, this bill is a natural um, consequence of some of the events that we saw take place this summer. Um, I think the Brianna Taylor case in particular highlighted the problems with these either no knock warrants or knock and announce warrants where basically law enforcement either knocks down the door with sort of a surprise element or perhaps, you know, knocks and gives an announcement, but, but very quickly thereafter is able to knock down the door. Um, again, sort of using surprise as the element um, to be able to fulfill their obligations. And we saw in the Brianna Taylor case that that ended with some pretty horrible consequences and results, I think, pretty much everybody would agree that that situation was a tragedy in all respects. And so there are a lot of you know, jurisdictions across the country that are grappling with how best to deal with these types of warrants. Some jurisdictions are doing away with knock and announce or no knock warrants altogether, no knock in particular. Um, you know, Here in Utah, we've been digging into this issue even before the Breonna Taylor situation. There was an unfortunate incident up in Ogden, um, a, a no knock situation that ended up with um, officers being killed, you know, in trying to execute these types of warrants. And so using that as really a jumping off point, the ACLU partnered with Libertas and others to pass legislation a couple of years ago, requiring transparency around no knock warrants and knock and announce warrants. And so there's an annual report that's provided um, on CCJJ's website, the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice website, with the breakdown of the numbers of these types of warrants that are executed by law enforcement agencies every year here in the state of Utah. So that's a really helpful, helpful thing um, that, that our legislation helped to produce. Um, a few years later, we decided to go back and look at the statute and, and make some modifications to make sure that, um, for example, law enforcement was sure of the right house that they had, that they're sort of some double check procedures before um, before engaging in these no knock warrants. And we also brought up this question about, you know, when should officers engage in these types of warrants? Should it be for, you know, the simple possession of drugs? And, and sort of the con conversation in the legislature in the past has been that, that that maybe isn't the appropriate justification for going in um, and, and doing these very dangerous warrants that can result in loss of life. So this year, the bill is sort of building upon those those previous efforts and also the national conversation that is happening around forcible entry more broadly. And so, you know, it considers a number of different different options, wanting to make sure that there is supervisory sign off on these types of warrants. Um, that's, a, that's a really important point. Um, there's some language in the bill that may or may not stay in around um, asking officers to wait a certain period of time before they actually enter after they knock and give notice. Um, that is specifically speaking to the situation of Breonna Taylor, where um, that was actually a knock and announce warrant, not a no knock warrant, but there was a lot of dispute after the fact about whether um, the appropriate um, notice was given, whether the individuals inside actually ever heard that knocking and that announcement. Um, and some questions about what time of day, you know, that there should be a presumption for these to be done in, in, in daytime versus nighttime. So those sorts of things really trying to um, maybe fix the process rather than banning no knocks altogether. And, and my understanding is that these types of warrants and these types of encounters are actually extremely dangerous for law enforcement in addition to any of the individuals they're serving. So there can definitely be benefits on both sides, I think, for having these kinds of reforms enacted. Absolutely. And that's what the, the situation up in Ogden really demonstrated, where you did have an officer lose his life. Um, you know, you imagine Utah is a state where a lot of people own weapons. Um, you know, if these warrants are executed at night and, and somebody um, doesn't know that it's law enforcement banging down their door, you can see how um, it would put officers in a very dangerous position as well. A homeowner might, um, you know, immediately reach for a weapon to protect their home. And, and so you can see how loss of life would be very likely in that scenario. Gotcha. So again, that's HB 245 from Representative Craig Hall, who's run re legislation on this topic before, I think. And we'll be waiting to see it come up in a hearing. Is that right? Yeah, I think he was not our sponsor in previous years, as I recall, but um, he is bringing up this bill this session and I think has, has strong feelings about it. Um, it was originally scheduled for a hearing today, but I think will likely happen a bit later. Got it. Let's move on to another a third element of criminal justice, and this actually involves cities and citizens, uh, uh, residents, and that is sort of the, the role and sort of the scope of civilian review boards. 
These are boards composed of uh, residents that advise um, the city and the police department and sometimes can review use of force incidents. Um, in Utah, we've had some restrictions on what cities can do with regard to civilian review boards ever since a, a law passed uh, two years ago, sponsored by Representative Paul Ray. There's been some attempts this year to kind of peel back some of those restrictions. Have they been successful? Unfortunately not, no. Representative Wheatley had a bill that was heard in committee last week, which did fail. Um, it would have rolled back Paul Ray's legislation from two years ago. And what I think was significant about that bill is it really um, limited the ability of local jurisdictions to decide if they wanted themselves to have an independent civilian review oversight of law enforcement. Independent meaning that that board would be given a lot um, more leeway to sort of recommend and make decisions about hiring and firing and, and those sorts of things. Um, by no means would, would Representative Wheatley's bill have required local jurisdictions to create these sorts of boards, but it would have given them the freedom to do so if they wanted to. Um, so really it comes down to an issue of local control, which usually we see lawmakers supporting. Um, but in this instance, there was a lot of pushback. Um, there was a provision in Rep Representative Wheatley's bill which would have banned participation on these boards by anybody with a connection to law enforcement. Um, so either former law enforcement themselves or their immediate family members. There was a lot of focus on that provision. And so I think if um, this type of legislation is resuscitated in the future, there might be some changes around that language. Got it. Okay, so it didn't go through this year, but potentially could be revisited in future years, um, sort of trying to bring back that local control. Okay, um, let's let's wrap up with the discussion of a bill that we think is going to cause quite a stir at the legislature, um, and that would be HB 302 from Representative Kira Berkland. It involves a ban on transgender women participation in sports, I believe, at the high school and the collegiate level in Utah. Um, you've been looking at that bill, talking to people about it. What are your impressions about uh, what it would do and what its prognosis here is this year? Yeah, so th again, this is not a Utah sort of um, unique piece of legislation. We're seeing these bills trotted out across the United States this year, cropping up in amazingly large numbers in particular this year. Um, our neighbors to the north, Idaho, did in fact pass this sort of legislation and is now embroiled in litigation, um, which sort of portends what the future path would be for Utah as well if we go down this path. Um, very likely that there would be litigation. You know, a really harmful piece of legislation, it basically tells transgender girls that they're not able to participate in school sports. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, I think is um, really a solution in search of a problem. We're not aware actually of any transgender girls that are currently participating in school sports right now, even in the state of Utah. Um, but furthermore, you know, we know that school sports really do provide all sorts of meaningful benefits to students. Um, you know, learning to participate in, in a team, working with others towards meaningful goals. Um, they're just tremendous benefits that we know sports confer on individuals, not only for school success, but later success in life. And so by telling a subset of, of girls that they are you know, banned from that type of advantage, I think is really harmful, particularly a group of individuals that we know are at higher risk of suicide from feeling um, issues of isolation and um, that they they are, can't participate and, and fully be themselves. So um, a really dangerous and harmful piece of legislation. Um, you know, we have not seen it assigned to committee yet, but expect that it will mm -hmm. be assigned. Um, unfortunately, we're hearing some um, suggestions that, that House leadership, for example, is supportive of this approach. Um, what I think is particularly challenging and dangerous about this legislation is that it sort of seems to be trying to pit the rights of transgender girls against um, women's rights more generally, this idea that somehow it's not fair to um, non-transgender women, uh, cisgendered women who, who are trying to participate in school sports. And that just really doesn't bear out. There's no, no reality there. Got it. Kind of using a, an argument trying to appeal that it's not discriminatory when in fact it, it really is stopping women, transgender women from participating in sports. So it's, it's exclusionary, it's not inclusionary is maybe one way to think about it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think it leads to some 
sort of interesting conversations about who should qualify for teams if we're going to get into this question about, um, you know, if the justification is that trans girls somehow have a physical advantage over cisgendered girls, I, I think that leads us into a strange place where we are now maybe evaluating, you know, whether body type has to be relevant in determining whether somebody can qualify to play in school sports. So I think that's a dangerous place for us to go. It's certainly not necessary. And um, hopefully, uh, calmer minds will prevail and decide that this is not the right path for Utah. And certainly Utah has a lot to lose if this becomes a bathroom bill, similar to what happened in North Carolina. We've got NCAA basketball championships, the Olympics, um, the All-Star Game, the NBA All-Star Game coming up, uh, coming to Utah. So certainly uh, those would be threatened if this bill goes forward, for sure. So I think that's right, especially because all of those organizations have policies that are contrary to this legislation. Well, thank you for that preview. We, we know that will be coming up. We're, we're getting ready for it. We appreciate all you're doing up at the Hill Marina on that bill and all of the others that aren't going to quite make the national news, but are still important. So thank you for your update, and we'll be checking back with you as soon as we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much.